the deep valleys and high plateaus of the Cambrian Mountains in Wales, a landscape worn by time and ages of moving ice. It is also a landscape much changed by man. Virgin forest once dominated much of these high tops and valleys, but over many centuries the trees have been cleared. Relics of that much larger ancient forest still cling to the hillsides. They are the hanging woodlands, the very special elements in this landscape that have brought me here. But there is added excitement for me in these remote mountains and valleys. The red kite, one of Britain's rarest breeding birds. It is the kite and its magical haunts that I am out to capture. Its slow and elegant flight, showing a profile that is unmistakable in the sky. A fork-tailed and long-winged bird of prey wheeling over the landscape. To know the kite better, I must first paint a much broader picture of the hanging woods, starting down in the valleys. You're never far from the sound of running water in the valleys, trickling streams in watery hollows where ash and alders grow, and in spring, filled with the sound of birds. A willow warbler. It's just as important to learn to recognize a bird from its song as from its plumage. Upland streams are typically home to birds like grey wagtails. They feed close to water, always on the move, snatching insects from the surface and from swarms in the air. The most unmistakable inhabitant of fast-flowing waters is the dipper, a strange and fascinating bird. Although they have the look of a large, plump wren, dippers are more closely related to thrushes and chats. Outwardly, there is nothing about them that hints at an aquatic life. Using actions that combine walking, swimming and flying, they search underwater for aquatic larvae, beetles and crustaceans, even very small fish to feed on. There's a membrane that closes the nostrils. Their plumage is unusually dense and well-oiled, and unlike other water birds, their toes are not webbed. The dipper is a fine example of the ability of birds to adapt to unusual environments 
without any obvious modifications. A common sandpiper, newly arrived from its wintering grounds in Africa, sings to establish its territory and find a mate. The challenge here in kite country is to capture a landscape with many elements that excite me as an artist. Movement of water. Shape and form of the mountains and valleys. Colours and shadows that are constantly changing. Hanging woods are ancient woods clinging to steep and inaccessible hillsides. They provide a home to a very special bird community despite having relatively few species. Members of the tit family are abundant. Blue tits. and coal tits. Sessile oaks are the dominant trees. They owe their small crowned and stunted form to the harsh environment. Soil nutrients are constantly being washed away leaving the thin and stony soils unable to support luxuriant vegetation. Rowan and birch cling to the hillsides among the oaks. Encouraged by the dampness, mosses, ferns and lichens ornament the slopes and trees. At first glance, these woods appear undisturbed. But a closer look shows that nearly all of them have in the past been used by man. For many hundreds of years they were coppiced for fuel wood, and timber was taken for pit props, agricultural machinery and ships. Charcoal and potash were products of the woods, and tannin was extracted from oak bark for use by the leather trade. With a decline in the economic value of woods, there has been little or no management for the past hundred years or so. The result is that many oak woods now consist mainly of old trees, and their long-term survival is threatened. To ensure the wood's survival, continued management is vital. Tony. Hello, Bruce. Tony Pickup, of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, is warden of the Denis and Gwynford Reserves, a mosaic of habitats that includes hillside oak woods. There's a few things that occurred to me whilst walking around, and, and one of the most striking is the complete lack of uh, understory. There seems to be no um, regeneration. Is this a natural situation, or is it something you've created? It's... it's totally artificial really. It's a function of two things. One is the fact that the trees here are it's what's called closed canopy. And once the leaves are on these trees there'll be no light coming to the floor which tends to suppress things like oaks from coming up. There, I mean, having said that, there's a, a young oak coming up. But the second thing which is going to affect it and probably affect it more than anything else 
is the fact that this woodland floor is grazed. There are small numbers of sheep in here all the time and little seedlings like that. They're quite palatable at this time of the year. If a sheep comes along and finds one of those, it's off and you know, you're going to lose the regeneration that you might otherwise have had. Hence, wide open spaces under the trees. So, uh, in effect, uh, sheep you would consider a management tool, or you use them as a management tool? Very much so, yes, that's right. If the idea is to use sheep to keep the understory down, what do you do to make sure the wood continues to regenerate? Well, the critical thing is to make sure that you don't have sheep on all year round. And we take the sheep off in the spring and summer. The other thing is that you have to open the canopy up. Here, naturally, in fact, there's an opening in the canopy, and you've got young trees coming through. And that gives you just enough regeneration to keep the wood going all on its own. Admittedly not dense regeneration, but enough to replace all the trees. So really, management of these woods is, is vital to ensure that they actually survive in the long term. Absolutely critical, yes. If you're going to maintain the bird populations that they've got, you've got to manage them very carefully. It is the openness of the woods that makes them ideal habitats for some very special birds. The red start. And the wood warbler. Both of them trans-Saharan migrants. The wood warbler needs a good tree canopy with little secondary growth in which to search for insects. The tree pipit, too, needs clear spaces at the woodland's edge or openings in the canopy. Feeding on the ground, it is inconspicuous. But to make itself visible during the breeding season, it must climb high above the trees and ground vegetation to announce its presence with a spectacular parachuting display flight. Natural holes in trees, suitable for small birds to nest in, are hard to find. But this pair of pied flycatchers has found a home. They are long-distance migrants and are perhaps the most distinctive bird of the woodland interior. Inside the canopy, they find an array of stems and branches for perching with a field of view little cluttered by ground vegetation or an understory. Useful vantages for feeding from, or proclaiming territory with song. An open canopy means I can get good views of all these small birds. With a lack of natural nesting sites, nest box schemes have been remarkably successful in providing enough alternative breeding sites.
The newly arrived migrants are still nest building, but some resident species, like the tawny owl, already have young. But not all residents are that advanced. Female chaffinches are still busy building their nests, whilst the male keeps an eye on the territory. High up in the oaks, this kite is incubating a clutch of eggs. But between now and hatching, they are in danger. Egg collecting has long been a problem. Peter Davis is the kite recorder for Wales. Is egg thieving still a problem? Yes, if anything, it's become rather more of a problem in the 80s than it was earlier. There's been a sizable increase in the number of nests robbed, and uh, one recent year we had 10 out of 40 robbed, which is a pretty severe uh, problem for us. The enthusiasm of Victorian egg collectors contributed to the red kite's decline, to a point at the turn of the last century when only five pairs remained. How many birds have you lost this year to egg thieves? Six nests so far that we know of, yes, out of the 57. It's quite a sizable problem, obviously, but something that we can contain, I think, uh, with the aid of uh, voluntary watchers and that sort of thing. What's the penalty if the, somebody's actually caught? Well, the maximum penalty now is £2,000 per egg, so it, it should be a considerable deterrent. In fact, m people seem to think it's worth it, so it's still happening. They have no commercial value. Not as far as we know, no. We think that um, most eggers are doing it just to beat the system, to uh, achieve a, a victory over the protectionists, if you like. Yes. To my mind, the modern sport of egg collecting is the pastime of a pervert. The loss of such potential beauty, like a kite on the wing, is bad enough. But to have my enjoyment stolen, and that of so many other people, so that one selfish individual can take private satisfaction in destroying a bird egg is sickening and absolutely unforgivable. Despite the problems the kite faces, the vigilance of its protectors is helping its numbers increase. So how many pairs would you have breeding in Wales this year? So far we've found 57 pairs with eggs. That's an advance of five on last year, 52. They reared 47 young that we know of last year and uh, we're banking on topping the 50 this year. So the population is, is climbing year by year? Yes, each year we seem to be gaining three or four pairs uh, in recent years anyway and that's quite a satisfactory increase. Breeding performance seems to be improving quite a bit and uh, it's hatching time now. If we get a few days of this fine dry weather and uh, no rain to drown the little chicks, we should uh, look forward to another good season this year. With the youngest bird at only 10 days old, the chicks are delicately fed by the adult. It is when hunting that the kite can be seen as controlled perfection on the wing. Drawing them is made relatively easy. Often, they seem to pause on the breeze, holding their position before spilling wind or gracefully turning on an updraft. Just long enough to snatch a sketch. The wing beats, characteristically deep and rather slow, are interspersed between bouts of gliding and soaring. The birds seem to sense every slight turbulence and changing current in the wind, adjusting the wings independently and constantly manoeuvring the tail. In this way, they steer towards currents of rising air, soaring and moving between thermals. Thermaling enables large, broad-winged birds to cover large areas with very little expenditure of energy. Although its long, fairly broad and often crooked wings are distinctive, the deeply forked tail, which even when fully spread still shows a deep notch, makes the kite unmistakable. In Shakespeare's time, the red kite was a common bird over much of Britain, scavenging urban and rural waste. 
a little over 200 years ago, it was still breeding in London. With improvements in sanitation and agricultural clearances, its range began to contract. Then, last century, an era of ruthless persecution by gamekeepers finally pushed it close to extinction. Oh, this is a very sad sight, Peter. How many birds do you find poisoned like this each year? Well, we find maybe one or two on average, but last year was a terrible year. We found ten dead kites in April and June, and uh, they'd all been poisoned with the same poison, uh, Fenthion. Yes, it's quite a considerable problem, really. I mean, it's never been so bad as that before, but some years we've had um, five or six in other years. And um, judging by the number of kites we find dead and send in for analysis, uh, it seems that probably more than half of all Welsh kites die prematurely from being poisoned. How are the birds picking up the poison? Well, in this area, the problem is the occasional shepherd who's having trouble with uh, crows and foxes at lambing time, taking a shortcut. They put poison of one sort or another on uh, lamb and sheep carcasses and uh, hope to kill the predators that way. The kite's just a scavenger who happens to get in the way and take some of the poison bait. It's not aimed at him, but it catches him as well. Although numbers are dangerously low, the future of the red kite in Wales is relatively secure. This brood has been successful. Almost fully fledged at 40 days old, they're still being fed by the adult. But it won't be long until they are on the wing hunting for themselves. Despite their reliance on carrion, kites are extremely versatile predators. But they are not valiant hunters, catching by surprise rather than speed. The largest kill might be a rabbit, but the smallest an earthworm, snatched from the ground. The well-being of the red kite and its continued steady climb from the dark days of near extinction is best assured by preventing egg thefts and stopping the poisoning. We can also ensure that the hanging oak woods they are tied to regenerate and survive. If they were ever to increase their numbers enough to spread out once more over the rest of Britain, I would like to think the kite would again adapt to living in close association with man. But for now, after centuries of persecution, all the kite needs is to be left in peace, to breed unmolested, to drift over the hills and valleys, unthreatened and without fear.